Hello everyone, today is Thursday, Cinco de Mayo 2016, and this is the week in charts. This week's week in charts is brought to you by, once again, Barking Squirrel Coffee Roasters. BarkingSquirrelCoffee.com. Good stuff. I had the Ethiopian this morning and it was excellent. I think I'm... Uh, a little partial to the Costa Rican, but uh, the Ethiopian is pretty damn, dang good. All right. It's also brought to you by me. I just like this graphic so much because it's, I think it's when I began the year and I created it around December, I'm thinking, I think we're in for a bumpy ride here. I think there's some issues going on with the market. And this is the slowest unfolding and I hate to use the word bear market, but for lack of a better word, bear market that I've ever seen. And I'm going to flesh that out in a lot of detail. So if you do want to follow along with the trading service, you can get started for just 47 bucks. A little teaser right there. There's a disclaimer screen. As you know, all predictions are about the future, and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. So what are we going to talk about this week? Well, I'm going to continue my discussion on 17 Secrets of trading and last week i think the the number one thing that i often preach is the number one secret is there is no secret so no one knows what a market will do exactly and that's not you and not me and certainly not the guy who screams on tv so i just wanted to reiterate that point now let's hop into the rest of them and if you want the one through seven uh you can check them out in last week's dave landry's the week and charts. So starting with number eight, you need one and only one simple methodology. Now I know I've told this story a thousand times and I'm probably going to tell it a thousand more, but I used to wake up really early and program. I still wake up re really early, but I, I don't no longer spend the first few hours of my day programming. But I would program these trading systems one after another after another, and then I'd tweak them, and then I'd do all, all these different things at all these different indicators, and add indicators to indicators, and sometimes even third and fourth derivative type of indicators. And usually by seven at night or so, I'd go home, and I'd be all excited, and I'd tell my bride, Marcy, hey, I just created this trading system, and it's so many percent correct, and it does this, and it does that. And she would usually suffer a fool gladly until one night she just kind of looked at me and cocked her head a little sideways, as your wife can do if you're married or your spouse could do, I should say. And she said, how many trading systems do you really need? And the answer to that question is you need one and only one methodology. Now, what methodology is that? Well, it's the one that you're going to follow, the one that you're going to follow. And... If you can't trade 10 methodologies, I'm sorry, if you can't trade one methodology, what makes you think you could trade 10? Now, keep in mind that a complex system is going to be much harder to follow. If you have all these moving parts, it's going to be very difficult to follow methodology. You can be much better off following something simple. Now, early on, I read a lot of these famous traders and all that just were doing these very simple things. And I'm like, oh, that can't work. There's got to be some sort of holy grail out there. And as I often talk about the trader's journey, you go through this journey where you're searching and searching and searching and searching, and then you come back to where you started. It's kind of like the, um, the true enlightenment is when you reach the end. I forget the toll star. Um, what's his name? Um, I'm trying to think of the quote. It escapes me at the moment. But the longer you're at this, the more you're going to find yourself beginning to simplify things. So complex systems are not only more hard to follow, but the reality is you could boil them down or usually boil them down to something much simpler. I'll be in presentations and and they'll have, a, and I know I've, this is another one of my, I know, big day beating a dead horse, you know. And there'll be a chart up here, and there'll be, you know, sell, buy, sell, buy, sell, buy. There'll be a 100 signals in here, okay? And usually when somebody's showing you their system, they'll usually plot a moving average. 
on the system and then they'll have again a hundred different buys and sells all throughout this this uh chart and if you just kind of eyeball a chart one thing that always amazes me and i, and I don't want to put somebody on the spot but one thing always amazes me if you just pay attention to something simple like daylight meaning that the lows are greater than the moving average instead of all these buys and sells you would just caught one, you just taken one trade, it caught a very, very, very nice trend. So the next time, and don't call anybody out because nobody wants to be called out, obviously, but the next time someone is showing you something very complex, see if you could simplify it down to something that's a lot more simpler. And when it comes to trend following, you can. And that I can promise you. All right, number nine. Now, I know it's cliche, but you need to plan thy trade and trade thy plan most people wing it and the reason people wing it when it comes to trading is because the moment you make a plan is the moment that you admit that you could be wrong and you will you don't want to be wrong and the other thing too is the moment you follow that plan Meaning that if it's hit your stop and you have to get out, you have you have to take your lumps. So even if people do trade their plan, I'm sorry, plan their trade, they don't trade the plan because they feel like, well, maybe it'll come back. And, and hope and fear and greed comes into the uh, equation. And I'm going to touch upon uh, micromanagement in a few minutes. But when you don't follow that plan, what happens is, let's say your stop gets hit, well, you start beginning to reason, well, maybe it'll come back. Maybe the market's oversold. And that's that's okay if you're just getting kind of nicked on it, but at what point do you exit? And I was in Hong Kong a few months back, and I got to know a very nice uh, gentleman over there. He was um, very kind enough to show me around and uh, be a little bit of my uh, host. And he told me, and he said he was a trader, but he said that the market, their market was down 30%, and he just, was just following the market now down, and he said, well, it's too late to sell now. Well, had he followed his plan, he would have gotten out the way, and then he could see new opportunities, plus he'd have new opportunities to, to execute, maybe even on the short side. So... You have to be really careful and plan to trade to trade the plan. And I'm going to talk a little bit about micromanagement here in just one second. And that kind of dovetails into that. One thing, as I was putting together this presentation this morning, it's like I kept juggling things around because they are all kind of intertwined. So you're going to see me repeat a lot of things that go back and forth here. So number 10 is you cannot separate emotions from the equation now if you go back i think it was two or three weeks ago i did a presentation on the fact that every decision has emotions attached to it it also has stress attached to it so anytime you make a decision there's going to be a consequence and unless you have emotions with that consequence that you can't make the decision and I know I've said this a thousand times, and I'll probably say it a thousand more, but Damasio and Shull would be more recent. Uh, Denise Shull talks about the fact that you can't make a decision without emotions, and that goes for any decision. Every decision has a consequence and emotions attached to it. So those people who have had um, God forbid, or the horrible thing happened to them where there are some sort of illness, cancer, or something really bad, or, or an injury to where that emotional part of their brain is is wiped out. If a doctor goes to make an appointment with them, and it's like, well, would you like to come see me Tuesday or Wednesday? And they'll say, well, Tuesday, and they'll give you a list of, of, of the ramifications of Tuesday, and then they'll give you a list of the ramifications of Wednesday, but they can't decide because one doesn't have an emotional consequence over the other. So what I would like you to do in your own life is the next decisions you make, what you're going to eat tonight, 
whether you stay home, go out, what you drink, what you don't. Just think about the emotions attached to that. I'm kind of watching what I eat a little bit here, but I'm really craving some fried fish. It has a little gas station that's the closest uh, place to my house where you can get um, food, at least, or, or close enough. And I'm really thinking about going to get some fried fish after this presentation. But I know that I'm going to be tired and lethargic after I eat that this afternoon. I've got a lot of work to do, and, and it's going to take a little time to go pick it up. So I'm going to, I have to think through this decision and, and think through the consequences. And even though it's just a stupid little decision about getting lunch, there is an emotion attached to it. And there is also some stress attached to it, too. And this is why I preach against day trading, because you're making too many decisions. And I think you only have so much of a fuse, and, and I'm not a psychologist or psychiatrist, nor do I play one on, on the Internet. But I think we only have so much of a fuse, and I think that's uh, kind of the, I guess is where burnout comes from. Scientists have literally proven that, you, that the nerves actually kind of actually get burned out. Uh, and that's an actual physical thing. So it's not just a, a figure of speech, but a, a physical thing. And, and that comes with a lot of stress. That's why you don't see a lot of long-term air traffic controllers. That's why you don't see a lot of long-term emergency room doctors or ambulance drivers and people who are, are in, under a lot of stress and have to make a lot of decisions on the fly. And the more decisions you make, the more stress you're going to put into your body. I think it uh, your your body releases is it cortisol when you make a lot of decisions and this sort of just kind of wears you down. And so the day trader who's making all those decisions over and over and over and over and over and over again, he is he is creating a lot of stress for himself because with each decision obviously comes the emotions and the stress. All right. Number 11, the market is a really bad teacher. Now, this is something that I talk about quite often. And the market is going to encourage you to take small profits before they evaporate. Because you're going to get into a trade, you're going to make a little, and then it turns to a losing trade. Then you can make a little, and it turns to losing trade. That might happen over and over again. So you're going to think, you know what? I'm just going to start taking profits, taking profits, taking profits, taking profits. And that will work pretty well until it don't. Sooner or later, you end up with a huge loss or you're going to miss the mother of all trends. And that one trend is what you really needed to make your year. So you can't let the market teach you that that's the way to go. And in fact, a lot of the system sellers out there will sell you Systems that take little bitty profits, they might be 90% accurate. Well, that sounds pretty good. That sounds pretty good on paper. Well, in theory, theory and practice are the same. In practice, they are not. The reality is you're gonna, you'll are gonna you make a little, make a little, make a little, make a little, and all of a sudden, bam, you're going to get wiped out. So you got to be careful in letting the market – you need to be a student of the market and understand markets, but just realize that sometimes they can be a bad teacher. Another thing that happens quite often is that market sells off hard, stops you out, and then what happens? It turns right back around and goes straight back up. Sometimes when I give a presentation, I'll say, raise your hand if you've, you've ever been stopped out to the penny and watched the stock take off without you. And usually half the room at least raises their hand. I think the other half of the room is too shy to raise their hand. It happens. Spelled a silent SH, okay? So you think, well, you know what? I'm not going to get fooled again. Now, who said that, right? So you're like, okay, well, it hit the stop, but, you know, Mr. Market, I'm just going to let, I'm, I'm not going to use stops. Let's just see what happens. Well, guess what? That one trade that you decide to do that on, the market does a reverse, and then you end up losing a lot of money. Never forget that it's a very process-oriented business where you have to follow the process. And the end result has nothing to do with whether or not you should reward yourself or not. Sometimes you can gamble 
and make money and so uh, psychiatrists have proven that when you when you get lucky people tend to say oh that's skill that was that was me doing the right thing and when you're unlucky or when you lose people tend to equate that to just bad luck tend to write it off the other thing I see quite a bit is well before we get to that I guess let's let's go in the number 12 here because we'll come back to that I want to come back to the the market is a bad teacher again like I said earlier it all kind of dovetails into uh, the micromanagement and these uh, not following your plan etc let's just let's hop to the next one number 12 you're gonna be wrong a lot so you need to get used to that and doctors find this difficult uh, engineers find this difficult and pretty much any other profession where you can't be wrong that much okay if half your bridges fall down or if you kill half your patients you're not going to be a doctor very long but in trading sometimes you could be wrong a heck of a lot more than you're right especially if you're a pure longer term trend follower and I try to improve upon that by using a hybrid approach but if you're a pure longer term trend follower you're going to be wrong 70 to 80 percent of the time okay and that's back from years ago when I did all that mechanical testing just to kind of see how things work so keep in mind that you will be wrong a lot and you need to get used to it and being wrong we, we all want to be successful. In fact, the, the problem with trading is it attracts the brightest minds and motivated people. And unfortunately, those are the worst people for trading, okay? Because you're going to try to outsmart the market. You don't want to be wrong. You've achieved a lot of success in your life by controlling the situation. But in trading, you have no control of the situation and you will be wrong quite a bit. And you feel like, well, I've got to do something. This trade is going against me. I know I haven't been stopped out yet, but there's no need to lose any more money on this trade. The, the market is, is going up. The sector is going up. My stock is going down. I'm going to get out. I see it all the time. I see people think okay it's so-called dead money because it's gone sideways or we have a small loss we've been sitting in this trade for a week maybe even a month Eh, let's get out what happens stock gets bought out the next day so micromanagement will really rear its ugly head and the problem is and this is why like I said earlier it kind of dovetails back in with the bad teacher Nine out of ten times, micromanagement is a thing to do. But that tenth time is going to keep you from being successful. So you're going to be wrong a lot. So there it is again. And let's say you're thinking about micromanaging, but you don't. You can't play the shoulda, coulda, woulda game. Yesterday I was talking to someone, and um, they said, oh, I almost got out of A Rock." the day before it imploded I, I almost got out oh man I'm, it's like I'm he's like mad at himself because he didn't get out of the trade well the plan was to stay with the trade until stopped out and some discretion can be used and we'll talk about that when we get to the charts I'll, I'll pull that one up if I get a chance but it's interesting that he was creating the stress for himself because he didn't make a decision. Like Rush said, the, the ban on a 401k tour, not the the old angry white man, fat and white man. <laughs> if you choose not to decide, you still have made a choice. So not only are decisions stressful, but the lack of or not making a decision or choosing not to decide is stressful.
and you can remove those that that thinking about micromanaging and not micromanaging and being stressed because you didn't micromanage you can remove that from the equation completely those not decision and a decision or not deciding decision i should say you can remove those two from the equation by following the plan so be careful with the micromanagement it's probably the biggest sin that I see and get used to being wrong the other problem that I see is would you start being wrong with the methodology there's two things can happen provided you have a viable methodology and I'm gonna speak from my hybrid approach to trend following People come in and the portfolio, I guess the equity curve looks about like that. And guess what? The market looks about like that. And then it'll probably flatten out a little bit and look about like this because there's fewer and fewer trades. And then people give up and they go off to chase rainbows. They say, well, you know what? This bead reversion type of system would work pretty good because the market's going up, market's going down. I'm going to just trade bean reversion. Well, what happens is the market begins to trend the day after, and then the equity curve starts looking like this, starts catching up to it. And another story that I say quite often is I show a chart where the S&P 500 looks like this, okay? And then on this particular day, somebody said, bravo for your system. And then the S&P 500 started doing this. And then someone on this day, same guy actually, said, uh, you suck in so many words. Now, all I was doing was following the methodology, so the equity curve looked like this. It kind of dove for a little while and then kind of flattened out a little bit. And you know, guess what happens after the you suck phase? It takes off again. And I call it African Queen Syndrome. Uh, yet another Dave beat the dead horse story. If you've ever seen the movie African Queen, and I'm, I have a copy around here somewhere, maybe I could send it to you if you need it, but you can get it cheaply. It's an old good movie. It's um, it's named Bogey and uh, is it? Oh gosh, is it Hepburn? I always get them confused. I think it's Hepburn, Catherine Hepburn. Anyway, they are trying to get to the lake, and they go through all this rapids, and the Germans are shooting at them, and leeches and mosquitoes and all these bad things happen to him and at some point the water gets really shallow and he gets out and starts pulling the boat and finally they just give up and he just they just exhausted defeated deflated okay screw it we're not gonna make it let's just quit and then the camera pans back and they were just a few yards away from the lake There's another story, I think it's called 10 Feet from Gold. Very similar type of thing. Somebody went out, they thought they had a gold vein. They, they dug and dug and dug and dug and dug, put all this money to equipment, and they just gave up. So they sold the equipment to people in the lease for pennies on a dollar. The people dug for like, I don't know how long it took them, but 10 more feet, and they hit one of the biggest gold finds ever in the United States. Now, this is not to say to be obstinate, and throw good money after bad if something doesn't work. But if you did your homework and you studied the markets for some time, which again is going to dovetail into another one of our quote unquote secrets of trading, then sometimes you know that maybe conditions just aren't conducive to your methodology. As we say, it's Hepburn. Thank you, Mike. Hepburn. So as we say in the South, the sun doesn't shine on the same dog's ass every day. And I felt pretty good so far this year because we were doing really well with trend following and the energy stocks and metals and mining. But now I'm, again, I'm beginning to get a little bit nervous. I'm kind of thinking, okay, how am I going to pull the next rabbit out the hat? And I know that I'll get a little stressed here and there. Trust me, I do. But I know that I just got to I just have to keep plodding away at it, doing my research, doing my homework, knowing that sometimes there's nothing to do, knowing that sometimes trading can be boring and you just have to wait. But I know that eventually it's going to work because it's worked in the past for many, many years 
And it should, I guess should be the keyword in that sentence, but it should continue to work because the only way you're ever going to make money in a market is to capture a trend, no matter what kind of trader you say you are. But again, people give up right before they get the gold. And I guess the worst thing can happen is sometimes people start here, somewhere back here, and they think that it will always be that way. That's permanent income hypothesis. That's, that's another lecture altogether. But what happens is because they, they hit a bad spot or a rough patch, they immediately think, okay, well, there's got to be something else out there. This stuff, just it no longer works, okay? Well, if you look at trend following, as I said, I think last week or whatever, or maybe in yesterday's webinar, I think it was rice in Japan in the year 1000 and some, somewhere in the thousands, there was a big bull market in rice. There was tulip media, uh, 1600s, I think, or 800s, I forget, 1600s. Uh, internet bubble, I remember that one, 1999. Uh, real estate bubble. I mean, there's lots of bubbles, which were huge trends throughout history. So sooner or later, markets will trend. They might chop around a little bit in between. But one of the biggest problems, and, it, and it's so funny, I guess, <laughs> I guess I'm going to have to rank these things. I'm always saying micromanagement is the biggest problem. But another problem that I see is jumping of methodologies. And I see people perpetually out of phase for as many as 10 years. And the problem is they occasionally hit upon something and they think that, ah, this is it. This is the holy grail. I'm going to, this is what I'm going to do from now on. And then they hit a rough patch there. And, and that goes for any methodology. You're going to hit a drawdown sooner or later. It's like uh, Mike Moody said, you know, uh, I said, Mike, you talk about relative strength here. I'm a huge fan of momentum. But what happens when that momentum ends? It, it, from my experience, momentum ends badly. And Mike's kind of a laid back kind of a guy. And he's he's about six foot five, but very laid back ex um, basketball player. He says, well, Dave, if you're going to have a baby, you're going to have baby poop. He says, babies are great. Don't get me wrong, but you're going to have a lot of baby poop. I wanted, um, well, actually, my wife, believe it or not, wanted some chickens. We've got a nice little farm here and real, really not raising much on it, so might as well take advantage of that and get some farm fresh eggs. I just ate about four of them. <laughs> They're delicious. But with those chickens, you're going to get some chicken poop. So every methodology has its nuances. You're just going to have to learn them. Now, number 13 is money and position management are crucial. And here's the big guess what to that. It's going to end badly that is one of the few things i can guarantee every trade is going to end badly george carlin once said when you buy a pet it's great right it's kind of like the baby poop thing right you buy a pet you th you think oh this is going to be great but deep down you know it's going to end badly and we've had a few uh, things at Bailey. In fact, we lost a chicken already. You know, it's like, uh, actually, we lost two chickens now that I think about it. But it's going to get badly. So if you think about it when it comes to a trade, two things are going to happen on every trade. Number one, you might lose on that trade. And number two, in the end, you're going to have to give up some open profits. The aforementioned trade in, in AROC, we were in nice trend following mode. It looked fantastic. We took our 1% off the table. And then it stopped out right around a scratch on the remainder. Well, at least you made 1% on your account. That's better than the poking in the eye. Better to have loved and lost than to never have loved at all. And Another beating of the dead horse today. Imagine that. Whenever this happens and someone complains, I tell them, 
send me a check. Centive Trading Co. Centive, I'm sorry, Centive Trading, not Co. LLC. P.O. Box 298, Abita Springs, Louisiana, 70420. Just send me that 1% of your account that you made on that trade overall. And I want you to forget about the trade. Because if you send me that money, then you could completely forget about it. It never happened. Okay? So it's going to hit badly. Yes. Yes. Did I drop an F-bomb? You guys darn right I did. Okay, I don't throw things, but I do drop f bombs, and I do get pissed off. I mean, I still have a pulse, right? We still have emotions. We still have stress. So yes, it's aggravating. But then it's like, take a deep breath, Dave. Did it work overall? Yes. Then be happy. But every trade is going to end badly. All right, number fourteen. Your best defense is a good offense. Yes, money management is crucial. And boy, I tell you, today is like the beat the dead horse day. But I'm going to keep beating the dead horse so you people get it. <laughs> As I've said before, I've, I've received several phone calls where people had been stopped out like 20 times in a row. And one guy, I think it was even 20-something times in a row. And these people are like really stressed out. And I said, well, you're doing two things, possibly two things wrong or some combination thereof. Number one, your stops are too tight, losing your stops. And again, to beat the dead horse, I saved a lot of people by talking them into loosening their stops. Provided you have a good methodology, then if your stops are looser within reason, okay, within just outside of the normal volatility, then you're going to catch more trends. I did two webinars on that going back about a month. So go in and check those out when you get a chance on the weekend charts. The second thing is that your stock selection could be a little bit better. So your best defense is a good offense. And you want to obsess before you get into a trade, not afterwards. So you see a stock, and it's it's amazing to me how many people, especially people who are smarter, okay, doctors, et cetera, who send me trades, potential trades. And if they send me a potential trade, they, they already bought it. I know that for the most part. Most people just want a little pat on the back or whatever. And like, Dave, what do you think about this? I'm like, well, it's gone sideways for six weeks. Are you a trend follower or not? You know, is you is or is you isn't a trend follower, as I wrote recently, you know. And you can't make something happen that isn't there. So is it a trend? Is that trend accelerating? Okay. What's your setup? Is the pullback deep enough based on the, the, the run that the stock has had? Or if it's an emerging trend, is it coming off a major low? Do you have a bow tie or a obvious first thrust type of setup? Is the overall sector beginning to bottom out? What's the overall market doing? Is it agreeing with what you are seeing? Okay, do all the pieces fit? Is there overhead supply just above where you would take the trade? You're looking to get in around 9, and then at 10 to 11, and go back in time, there's just a big wad of overhead supply. So you know if you take that trade, it's going to be capped, likely, by that overhead supply. So what I would recommend you do is learn how to pick the best stocks. I know it's cliche, but pick the best and leave the rest. And then I have an hour video on my stock selection page. So go check that out after the webinar. And then uh, if you're watching recording of this, there should be a link right here you could click on. Now I spent 14 hours discussing stock selection, but if you watch that video, I think you're well on your way. It amazes me, you know, it, it, this is, this is a, a, Soft sell, I guess, for lack of a better word. But it amazes me how many people would just throw 
thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars at a market, but they won't spend a little money to get educated, which in the long run is not only save them thousands of dollars or make them money. And everything I do, if I didn't believe it's worth more in uh, use value than it is in cash value, I wouldn't do it. And that's that's from the um, Science of Getting Rich. It's kind of, that's a book that's out there. It's kind of, it's in public domain. You could just download it on the internet if you want to read it. It's a little out there, but what he says makes a lot of sense. And I and that's kind of my mantra. It's like if I'm going to, what I do for a cash value should should be able to exceed that. You should be able to get your money back and then some. And then that's my mantra. And obviously, I can get into a lot of trouble if I put a guarantee on that. I can guarantee or your money back on your purchase. But I can't guarantee it that you could take it to be successful. But I truly believe that you will and that you can. All right, 15. You're going to need some experience, even though I just soft sold you on courses. And by the way, if you get the stock selection course, shoot me an email and say, hey, Dave, I'm going to get the course. Give me a year of your service along with that course, like you mentioned in your webinar on um what's today thursday single de mayo and that'll be good for a week so if, if you get it within a week shoot me an email and that way you could see me see my stock picking i teach you how to do it and then you'll see it in reality you'll see the theory then you'll see it in practice now even if you do that you're still going to need some experience if you haven't had your buttocks handed to you in the markets then you don't know how you're going to act when that happens, okay? If you haven't been through a bear market, then you don't know what you're going to do when that happens. I'm guessing that the aforementioned gentleman who was down 30% along with the Hang Seng was because he's probably never lived through a bear market. Once you live through a bear market holding on to a bunch of stocks, then you're like, you know what? These markets go up, and gosh darn it, they also go down. So I'm going to either have to learn how to short stocks or get out the way. Getting out the way, there's nothing wrong with getting out the way, by the way. I think you should learn how to short stocks, not so much because it's the only way to make money, but because it helps you to see both sides of the market if you play the long side and the short side. Anybody who plays just one side and not the other, always tends to be a little bit biased. I have friends that run a lot of money and they're long only, okay? And nothing against them, but they always seem to be a little bit bullish, even when things are looking sort of bleak. So it's good to see both sides of the market. And you get that through experience. Now, what's amazing is you wouldn't decide on Friday that you're going to be a surgeon and read a book over the weekend, go pick up some exacto knives at Wally World, and then start cutting on people on Monday. Even if there weren't laws against that, certainly you wouldn't do that. But that's exactly what a lot of people do. And this goes for not just doctors, but lawyers and automatic transmission mechanics. So the point I made in the column, my last column was, even if you're going to only do trading on a very casual basis, you're going to have to take it really, really seriously. Trading is not really, shouldn't really be taken as a hobby. If you want to, you know, find something, it doesn't, find something that you enjoy, even if it's going to be expensive. It's, my wife calls me hobby boy. But find something you enjoy, even if it's expensive. Don't make trading your hobby. Don't do it casually, okay? Do it seriously, even if you just kind of see it as a hobby. Number 16, the market doesn't move on your time frame. And, and again, you can see how this kind of dovetails back into the conversation of people quitting or people jumping from method to method and continually joining the church of what's happening now. Sometimes you just have to wait. And as I wrote in a column, 
two of our biggest winners so far this year, knock on wood, are CNX and CENX. They've been uh, two little um, stocks that worked out nicely, energy slash metals and mining type of stocks. And the day before I found those two setups, somebody emailed me and said, Dave, I'm taking a break from the service. I'm like, okay, what's going on? Well, I don't see how you can have any setups in the foreseeable future. And I'm like, mm, I can't argue with that. Uh, you're right. I haven't seen anything in a week, maybe longer. And I don't, I can't see where there's anything, but you have to keep chipping away at it because you'd never know when that big opportunity is going to come along. It's kind of like the, what's the story about the ladies in the Bible, the sisters or whoever they were holding their little lamps with the oil. And you hold your lamp up so the husband can find you, potential husband can find you. Well, oh, I'll get some oil eventually. There's, there's, no, there's no husband coming today. Well, maybe there will be. I don't know. You have to be there which is our next point. You, got, you have to be present to win. But you don't know when that trend is going to come along. So this gentleman emails me, hey, you know what, I'm just going to take a break. Well, next day I found two of the best setups so far this year. And without those two setups, your performance would be somewhat mediocre at best. So the market doesn't move on your time frame. Sometimes you just have to wait. And the thing about my method, I make a lot more money in my method, uh, in my educational business with my methodology on the educational side. If I told people that you could get rich really quick, like I said last week, make $10 million in 10 minutes a day. It's, it does take time. And then my point is you're not going to get rich overnight, but longer term, you'd be pleasantly surprised. The people who are out of phase for 10 years, and again, I see it all the time, chasing methodologies, if they'd have just stayed with the simple trend following with a bit of a hybrid approach to the position in money management, a little bit of a swing trade, turn that swing trade into a longer term trade, chip away at it, trade with conditions are conducive, and then sit on your hands for the methodology and sit on your hands when they're not they would be doing really well. They'd have 10 years of gains as opposed to 10 years of losing money chasing systems. The other thing is, and it, again, this they're all kind of dovetail together, is that you must be present to win. So let's say you did take a break when those two setups, those two aforementioned setups came along, then you would have missed two great setups. Some people say, well, I'm not going to trade in the summers because it's choppy. Well, it is choppy to summers, and I hate summers, and it sucks. It's like I looked at my calendar. It's like Cinco de Mayo. Today is May 5th. Oh, no, it's almost summertime. So that begins to concern me because it could get choppy in here. And by the way, I think it might be time to uh, dust off an old uh, webinar I did. Last year, I did a webinar, Sell the Man, Go Away. And that's just that's just not true, believe it or not. So you got to be careful of those adages and old sayings and stuff. But before I digress too far, you can't say I'm going to take off the summer because summers are choppy. Well, summers are usually choppy, but you might get some really big winners over the summer. So the market doesn't care about your time frame, and trends can happen in any month of the year. And you got to chip away at it. Now, it doesn't mean you trade your ass off all summer long. You might just do your homework. Oh, there's nothing here. Let's go to the beach. Um, I go to the beach sometimes during the summer. I take my laptop with me. <laughs> you know, anytime I leave the house, I have a laptop attached. That's just because of the territory. It is what it is because I know you must be present to win. And it really doesn't stress me out that much. I, I don't think I could be without the markets okay it is what it is all right any questions thoughts comments complaints about anything so far Donald says Dave the methodology seems to lend itself to positions that are concentrated just a couple of industry groups and oftentimes they are correlated for example latest market with metals in oil and gas well you're seeing you're seeing a bit of an aberration Okay, 
uh, you're just looking at that. You have to look at the last 10, 15 years of everything. Because sometimes you'll have a biotech, a semiconductor, an oil and gas stock, and a few other things. Right now, that's the only thing worthwhile. Okay? So, yeah, as a general statement, yes, you are correct. But you have to be careful when it comes to markets. It's kind of like feeling the elephant. I put that in the column once. If blind men feeling an elephant, you know, one guy's going to think it's a rope because he's grabbing onto the tail. One guy's going to think it's a a tree because he's, he's holding on to a, a, a leg. Everyone's going to think it's something else. But, yeah, right now that is 100% correct, and that's where – you got to realize that that's not always the case. Um, if the overall market gets in a rip roaring uptrend, then you're going to see um, a plethora of setups at a plethora of different areas. Right now, that's the only thing that's happening. But yeah, that is a bit of a bummer because that's the only thing that's happening, and we're—I um, wouldn't say we're overweighted, but we're we're obviously focused on that one area for the most part. And we've got one one little stock that's outside of that area. But, yeah, that's that's one of the nuances of the methodology is every now and then you only get a few setups in one area. Sometimes you won't get any setups in any areas. But absolutely, that uh, it happens. I just noticed OZRK imploded yesterday, alert IRA, SOHN conference. You were just barely stopped out. Yeah, that happens. We, uh, it happens with a, with a silent SH. I actually got a few clients that applied a little bit of discretion to that trade, and they were asking me to kind of help them walk through what they should do now. And it happens. I mean, ideally, you want to try to ride it out as long as you can and have that stop as loose as you can, but sometimes you just get knocked out, and you have to go on with your life. You can't say, damn it, I got stopped out. I'm not going to use stops anymore. So it happens, okay? But, yeah, it, it did. And in a case like that, you could always apply a little discretion, but don't throw caution to the wind. Just like um, I haven't looked at it today, but A-Rock had a big reversal yesterday after selling off hard. Well, if your plan was, okay, I, I know I'm in a damage control situation. I'm going to give it this wiggle room, and you're not stopped out, and you stay with the reverses, that's fine. But if you your plan is, I'm going to give it some wiggle room, you get stopped out, it hits your uncle point, then by all means, you need to exit. That'll make more sense in a minute. Oh, look at Phil, <laughs> my buddy Phil. OZRK hit the 50-day moving average. I'll say no more. Yeah, Phil's a big plan at the uh, plan of uh, trading around that 50. And we'll take a look at that one in a second. A couple announcements. I'm still working on a website. Uh, if you have any opinions or comments, on what I could do better or what would you like to see, let me know. Uh, there's a lot of work that's going into the, the site, and there's a lot of older content that's being put into the back end. Um, and I've kind of tweaked it a lot. I'm, I'm trying not to just keep changing things, but I'm, I'm hoping that every little change I make is for the better. But let me know if there's something you'd like to see. I'm still having the Fast Track special, and I'm going to run this uh, until the end of May or until I think I have um, – enough people to keep me busy because there's only so many hours in a day, but you can get everything for over 50% off. You click on the uh, banner ad on my website for more on that. Uh, I am podcasting. I might need to, uh, some of you guys want to test it for me. That'd be awesome. If you could see if it's getting loaded to iTunes last week, I noticed it wasn't, didn't look like it was getting loaded to iTunes. I don't know if that's my problem or not. So there's a lot going on and anybody wants to help me test these things. That'd be awesome. Any questions, shoot me an email, and then obviously you can find uh, contact information if you forget about that, daviddavelander.com, but uh, contact information on my site. Uh, this direct email works a lot better than the contact box, just FYI. I'll find uh, letters in spam three or four days late from the, from the uh, contact thing. So uh, if you're watching this, just use my direct email. The reason I don't have the direct email on the website is to try to keep the spam down. And even with the with the contact box, we took it a lot of it. Okay, let's take a look at the overall market, and then uh, before we do that, let's take a look at that AROC and and, and that um, OZRK. If you guys want to start talking about individual stocks right now, that's fine. Uh, just start asking. Just if you want to know about 
what I think about a stock, just punch in the symbol and hit return. Just put one on each line, in other words. Now, we talked about this one. If you go to my website uh, in the uh, from a couple days ago, I did a video update where let's let me show you where that is. It's right here now on the website. But if you're watching this uh, this afternoon or after Cinco de Mayo, after May 5th, then it's going to be loaded here into more posts. But I did a little quick lesson on this on discretion. And so I don't want to spend too much time on this. But when you have, let's say you have a stop that's here and the market gaps open way down here, what you could do is give it a little bit of wiggle room just in case it reverses. Notice how it reversed yesterday and went straight back up. So forget about this bar for a second. Let's say that it did gap open here. You could give it a little bit of wiggle room on the trade. And if it goes straight back up like it did yesterday, then you stay with the trade. If it stops you out, it stops you out, okay? He who fights and runs away, what? Lives to fight another day. So that's a little thing about discretion. And you know what? That's a baby poop, okay? You, you want some farm fresh eggs? You're going to have some chickens? You're going to have chicken poop, okay? You're going to lose a couple of chickens, <laughs> at least in my case, and you're going to have chicken poop. But you know what? Those farm fresh eggs are pretty damn good. I'm, I might make me some tuna fish for lunch with those farm fresh eggs. They're good. So if you're going to trade momentum, sooner or later it's going to end badly, no matter what you do. So you can't let that stress you out. It comes with the territory. Uh, let's take a look at that OZRK, and then uh, I'll talk about the overall market, and then we'll take a look at your individual stock picks. Keep them coming. Uh, yeah, my buddy Phil pointed out that it uh, just went up and tagged that 50-day moving average. Let's see. I don't see a tag. It looks like it exceeded it to me. Is that right? Yeah, I'm not seeing it, Phil. Yeah, I see where it sliced through. Phil, Phil sometimes, correct me if I'm wrong, He'll wait for something to trade up to the 50 and then uh, look to short it as it bounces it off. Or unless in this case, crossed above and crossed back below. But, yeah, we had a stop. I forget exactly where it was, but it wasn't too far from the peak here. And it stopped out. You know what? It happens, okay? Now, you never want to throw caution to the wind. But if you could say, okay, well, let me just give it so much wiggle room. And if I get stopped out, I get stopped out. If I don't, I don't. As long as that's kind of part of the original plan. If you go in and look somewhere on my website, I have the plan you trade and trade your plan sheet. I actually found it on somebody else's website. Somebody had had borrowed it from me, which was kind of flattering, I guess. They gave me they gave me credit, so I'm I'm not upset. I'm glad they did that. In fact, you could post content if you want on your own sites. That's fine. Just make sure you reference back, or just put a link to my stuff to begin with instead of putting it on your site instead of scraping it. Anyway, I digress. But if you plan your trade, trade your plan. If you look at that sheet and email me if you need to help help finding it on the website. It's I think it's buried in the education. It's a little PDF. And part of that is what discretion will you apply? If you're if you're new or newer to trading or and or lack discipline, then you just want to follow things a little bit more mechanically. Okay? But if you have a little experience and you have a little discipline, then by all means, you can use a little discretion. Don't add a whole bunch of decisions for yourself and don't stress yourself out and don't shoulda, coulda, woulda yourself. But you could say, okay, I'm going to trend follow this position and I'm willing to give it a little bit of wiggle room around that stop. And that's completely fine. Watermark that content, buddy. What does that mean? Watermark the content? Watermark it? Ah, so Phil said selling a break below. So you got a thrust below. Yeah, that's fine. You got, that's, that's, uh, that's trend following. That's, that's kind of interesting. So his point is that you got a thrust below it uh, and then you got to break down below it again. Okay, I got you. OZRK hit the 200 day moving average. Let's take a look at that. And then we need to hop out to the overall market real quick, so I don't forget. All right, let's take a look at a 200-day moving average. Is that right? Yeah, look at that. That's kind of fun. That's kind of cool. Yeah, look at that. A little, a little. 
Little kiss of that moving average, huh? Hey, look at that. Death cross. <laughs> Did a few uh, webinars on that, too. All right, let's take a look at the overall market in case I forget, or so I don't forget, and then we'll um, we'll get to your stock picks, I promise. We have plenty of enough time this week for everyone to get answered. Last time, last few times, I think we ran out of time. All right, what are the P's doing? Well, you can see they're just kind of pulling back in here, if you want to call it that. Unfortunately, though, they've pulled back to all the way where they've broken out and then some. So they've given up their last little recent breakout. The other thing that you need to remember is if you look at them on a net net basis, especially if you're looking at like yesterday's close, because we don't know what today's going to close, okay? And you can see they really haven't made a whole lot of forward progress in quite a while. So that's been six weeks approximately of no forward progress. So one problem that I see quite often, and this is something that I'm, I'm putting into a beginner's course that I'm working on, is that people look at a market on a net net basis as i often preach and say okay since february oh man this market looks pretty good they see this but they don't see this they don't see this sideways movement here okay so you know tarzan speak this good okay this good right but this bad so when a market begins to lose a little momentum you have to become concerned the other thing, too, is we still have, as I've been saying, a lot of overhead supply to overcome. So for me to get excited about this market, it would have to break out to new highs somewhere up here and stay there. Now, I was talking with a client last week, and one thing that I explained is sometimes in markets, it's good to come up with a few plausible scenarios. Follow your method on a day-by-day -day basis. Have some sort of framework that you want to work around, that you're going to work around. And again, like I just said, the market would have to make new highs for me to get excited. There's still some issues with this market. So until those issues get resolved, which I'll mention in just a second here, I'm not going to rush out and get crazy bullish on the market. But one of the plausible scenarios would be for this thing to break out to new highs and then we can have like that one last blow off move. It is an election move. Uh, it is an election year. They do tend they do tend to prop the market up a little bit during an election year. OK, seems seems that way, at least. So maybe there could be some and I hate to say the word manipulation, manipulation in the market. Little Cajun man coming out in me manipulation to push this market higher. That would be possibly the scariest scenario ever if we went to a blow off mood mode because anyone who has held since 2009 would breathe a sigh of relief. You'd have some Johnny come lately come rushing to the market. And then when, not if, when it ends, it would really end badly. So that's just one scenario. I guess we could sit around all day and talk about hypotheticals. I mean, what would the world be without hypothetical questions, right? And it's spelled with a W. Um, Stephen Wright, right? Anyway, so Mark, it's got its work cut out for it. it. This is especially true when you take a look at like the NASDAQ and even more so in the Rusty. But the NASDAQ, and I've got it kind of messy in here, but as you can see, so far this just looks like a big picture retrace, and now it's beginning to sell off fairly hard. I'm sure after the fact somebody's going to say, oh, it was a it was a third of a fourth of an ABC correction of a, a zigzag inverted whatever. Well, it just stalled out at resistance, okay, overhead supply. Nothing magical about overhead supply. Overhead supply is just where some trading occurred, and there's people behind those bars, okay. They're not just magical little ticks on the screen. So those people who bought – during that range, you might be looking to get out of break even, as I've been mentioning quite often. You know, I need some new stories. I need to get out of the house. I got to go somewhere. I haven't left the house in a, in a while here. I need to get out, see the world again. But as I've been mentioning quite a bit, one of my old stories, old new stories, is uh, a friend of my wife's. She started investing. She's taking control of her family's finances. She's getting her act together. You know, good for her. Kudos for her. So she started investing in 2015, and then she unfortunately found an advisor who's not much of an advisor, more of a salesman. 
and certainly not a market timer. And so she starts investing last year. That plus fees, she's now down significantly. She might even be down double digits. She's really rethinking this stock market investment thing, okay? Because she she was told, we're in for the long haul. The market always goes up longer term. Bullshit. But I don't want to digress too far. The point is, the Johnny come lately is those who have just bought stocks over the last year and those who who throw in a towel and buy if this market goes on the new highs are going to be the first out. And then that could exacerbate the spelling, the selling. Anyway, let's not worry about that until it happens. Right now, we have to worry about the fact that the NASDAQ has sort of rolled over in here. You could argue, well, Dave, it's just retraced this leg up. Maybe it is, but unfortunately, it's piling into this overhead supply or bumping off this, not piling, but bumping off this overhead supply. The Rusty looks the worst still, as I said earlier. Uh, take a look at a weekly here. We are stalling out. We'd sell it off fairly hard on a weekly basis, down two and a third percent so far on a week over week basis. And what do we have? A mountain of overhead supply to overcome. So that looks pretty ugly to me. By the way, I don't want to get too far into this, but we still have an official bow tie down on a weekly chart on the S&P 500. Yeah, they're trying to cross back up in here. But this is a major signal because it came off of all-time highs, and this would be a minor signal in here, okay? Yeah, a market can move off a minor signal, but pay attention to these major signals. And I know I got asked to stop showing it because um, <laughs> I show it so often, but in 2000, we had a sell. In 2003, we had a buy. In 2007, we had a sell, early 2008, I guess. And then in 2009, we had a buy. 2015, we had a sell. All those other signals printed money, longer term at least. So is this signal going to work? I don't know. But as Greg Moore says, we treat all signals as if it will become the big one. Okay. And he also said, whipsaws are frustrating. Bear markets are devastating. So there's nothing wrong with sitting on your hands a little bit until this market proves itself. Now, as Donald pointed out, we are long some stocks, and we're long mostly energies and metals and mining, and that's because that's the only thing that's been setting up in this questionable, at best, type of market. All right, let me just show you a few sectors in here, and then we'll pop out to the overall market. I'm sorry, we'll pop out to your, your stock questions. Some of these areas that were working their way higher, like drugs, have rolled back over, as you can see. So it's no big shocker with the overall market becoming somewhat questionable again. A lot of areas have become really questionable too. Uh, drugs, what else? Health service is kind of interesting. It made it all the way to its old highs. This looks pretty good shorter term, okay? But you have to see the forest for the trees. You back the chart way out, and you can see it's right at the prior peak in here. It, it looks like it could turn into something like a classical, uh, something that you'd see in a, a book of technical analysis written 50 years ago. In other words, a big double top or something. A um, lot of other sectors becoming questionable, like the banks, you know, that old ZRK, obviously rolling back over in here. But you can see banks kind of retraced up, little ABC up. Oop, did I say that? Little one, two, three leg up. And now they're headed back lower. But back to chart way out, you can see this whole thing was just a retrace. Um, can you ride out such a retrace? Well, in the case of OZRK, obviously no, but it pays to play on the side of the trend. You certainly don't want to rush out and try to buy stocks as a general statement or stocks in general. Let me just show you energies. Both sectors kind of look like um, that, like the semis. You can see they rallied up, and then they bumped up against a little resistance, roll back over. So most sectors look like that. Some of the sectors that have been doing really well, like the foods and toilet paper and things like that, uh, or beginning to lose a little bit of momentum in here, okay? So you see, like, the foods aren't a great example of what I'm trying to point out, but they're a decent example. You can see they kind of broken out, and now they're just kind of meandering sideways. It's just not worth playing something like this, especially with the volatility so low in that sector when it's the only game in town. Maybe utilities will give me a better example of what I'm trying to show you. There's one sector, maybe non-durables, 
Let's see if I can find utilities. There we go. So you can see they just made it past their old highs in here, and then they're already kind of rolling back over. So this is where it's kind of dangerous to, to play those so-called defensive issues, such as utilities and the foods. Um, overall, I think the market's in trouble, but as Donald pointed out, energies and metals and mining, the only thing that are kind of working in here. And you can see they've had a pretty good run from lows in the energies, bow ties and first thrust and all kind of things set up there and ditto for the metals in mining. All right, let's hop out to individual stocks. It took me a long time to get here. Dave, the stair step pad or the safe zone is a great place to wait for that next step. I never got above it the first step before listening to you. Oh, that's what you were trying to say. Okay, Rick had uh, emailed me earlier. The safe zone is a great place to look for the next step. Yeah, so when you're trading that pullback, you want to wait. You want to, okay, we got a trend. That's good. If you're newer to trading, absolutely trade these more established trends. Wait for that pullback and then look to get in if and only if, as uh, Rick pointed out, that stair step continues. Have an entry in place, and if that stair step continues, then get in for hopefully a long, long time. Andre wants to short HMY. That's brave. Andre wants to go after a goal. Let's take a look at that. HMY. Thanks for those books, Andre. I appreciate that. I've been reading those. Um, well, it's hard to short a stock below $5 a share. Uh, a lot of a more reputable, a more reputable broker won't let you do it. Um, I hear you. You've got a bow tie down, sort of a bow tie down. I think it looks like it's in trouble, but you're also shorting at relatively low levels longer term. So I would be less inclined to short these stocks now. Oh, you want to go long? Okay. All right. I was about to say. <laughs> uh, well, the problem now with the golds is that they've lost some momentum. I'm still kind of a bull in the goals, but this stock trading my methodology would actually have to, if I can make it work, Make it work. But I actually had to break out to new highs. I'm embarrassed that I knew how I knew that saying. <laughs> Would have to break out to new highs and then pull back for me to get excited. Okay. Twitter short, TWTR. TWTR. Uh, I think we talked about this one last week. This is a case where let's see if I can fix my charts. This is a case where it's already down, way down here at its old lows. Can it go lower? Absolutely. Okay. But I'm less excited about shorting a stock down here as I would be shorting a stock up here. Okay. And if you go in and look at all the shorts from earlier this year, OZRK, MOH, uh, anybody in the service, Phil, help me if you can think of some other ones that we shorted. Uh, we shorted quite a few stocks. And if you go in and look at those stocks, You'll notice, I think MOH was from last uh, year, but you'll notice these stocks that we shorted were more at, at higher levels, like way up here, as opposed to waiting for them to get in that second and third leg down, okay? Now, once shorted AIZ, okay, we'll take a look at that. Once you get into a, ooh, that's brave. Uh, once you get into a rip-roaring downtrend, then it's you can't short those stocks at high levels because obviously there's no more level. Oh, we shorted AIZ. I'm sorry. Oh, my apologies. Yeah, AIZ was one of our shorts um, recently. Thank you. I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Angelo. Uh, yeah, see, notice how this was the setup back here at the AIZ, okay? Okay, Hari wants to go along Facebook. Um, let's take a look at this. Let me zoom in here. Well, you do have a nice little gap up here. Uh, one thing that I'm kind of seeing is it looks like it's trading in chunks, and I bet these are probably three months chunks around the earnings. Uh, it's kind of wide and loose, and it's super, super duper volatile in here. Uh, I think I would leave it alone unless it could accelerate higher and then pull back. I mean, it'd it have to get into the 120s and change, maybe 125 or more, and then pull back for me to get interested in it. Also, I'm not too excited about stocks in general at this juncture. The reason I like the um, reason I like the energies and metals on mining is because they can trade contra to the market. 
Okay, yeah, we shorted CCL, DY, thank you, Phil. CCL. And see, CCL was, was right here, got it marked up. You can see that was at coming off a high level, right? So the short was here in CCL, we shorted DY. Um, I don't remember exactly, but I think it was like right here, it's still at a fairly high level. And then uh, OZRK we talked about, and then MOH. Yeah, I just showed that one. Thank you, Phil, appreciate that, good job. Yeah, it's it's once I get stopped out, I kind of forget about a position pretty quick. GoPro short. GoPro GPRO. Yeah, see, this would have been uh, a really good short back here, obviously, but now you're down towards these. Uh, it's kind of bottoming out, if anything. So I wouldn't go after that. It's too late. Heather says, Dave, thanks for all the great webinars and articles you share with everyone. You're welcome, Heather. Checks in the mail. You know, I make jokes like that, and some people are like, I can't believe you pay those people. It's like, it's a joke. LGCY is going to be a little too volatile. But, yeah, good eye on that, Angelo. Uh, this is one I have been watching. But look at the HV, 208. So it's just, it's it's even it's even crazy by Dave Landry standards. Um, I was working with the fun a while back, and I said something about, would you be looking to get into any of these stocks after hours? He goes, now are your stocks. <laughs> it's like... <laughs> Yeah, I I do like the more I tend to like the more volatile stock within reason. Read uh, Devil Better the Devil You Know, as I talked about uh, volatility uh, last week or week before. Uh, it looks beautiful, but the but it's crazy volatile. Look at this 208 on the HV. Uh, so far today, it's up 19%. Gaps open comes right back in. Yeah, it's a decent looking stock, but I would be super darn careful with that. So that's the only thing. AG is going to be a silver stock, and uh, it looks good uh, if it keeps pulling back. The problem with these silver stocks and some of these goals is that they have had such, especially more speculative issues, they've had such an amazing run. This is already up three and four hundred percent that for me to get excited now, would have to have the mother of all retraces. The mother of all, I, I actually use the word retrace, okay, would have to have a deep pullback. So let it pull back quite a bit. KGS, it's going to be King's Gold. KGS, I think. KGS. Nope. KGS. Well, I think I know the stock you're talking about. It just won't punch up. FCX, that's going to be Freeport MacMoron. Um, yeah, this is one that it just – Keeps plowing through that overhead supply, but that's one thing that does concern me is it does have some overhead supply to deal with. It's a little wide and loose. Um, I would try to find something. It's okay. I would try to find something else, though, with less uh, longer-term issues than Freeport Mac Moran. It's also a big stock, a big, thick stock. You might be able to find something that's not quite as thick, but you can see that it's going to run into a little trouble up here. I guess that's okay. It has lost a little momentum, too. I mean, if you're long, stay long by all means, but it just it's lost a little momentum in here. I, I'd see if there's something else you could find within the metals. IAG for John. Hey, John. John left and came back. I'm glad I didn't talk about you. <laughs> yeah, this could set up soon. I like this. This is on my watch list, uh, but it's going to have to pull back a little bit in here. I do like the way it broke out the base, but yeah, IAG needs to be on your list. <laughs> Trying to take a leak. Uh, C Z C Z Z C Z Z is gonna be cousins, I think, if I can find it. Let's see if we can fix this. Too many windows open. All right, C Z Z cousins, right? Or cousin, cousin. Well, this is a this is a food stock, uh, but it is uh, volatility is pretty high on it for a food stock. Uh, longer term, it has a lot of problems, a lot of overhead supply to overcome. Uh, I think I would pass. It, it, that's something that we talked about for probably an hour in the stock selection course is how do you gauge this overhead supply? Uh, it does take a little experience, but the longer it is, the closer it is to above the market and the, the, the closer it is to current trading. Now, you have to go back a year for this overhead supply, but I still think it's relevant in this case because there's so much of it. So it is a bit of a discretionary call, but there are a few things you can look at. So I'd pass on that one. 
TRV, too late to short. Hey, soon, good to see you. Uh, yeah, it's a little wide and loose, too. Um, I wouldn't say it's too late because this gap is not tremendous in here. But, yeah, based on the volatility, yeah, I think I'd pass. Um, but it's a little wide and loose, too. I think the stock's in trouble, though. Um, you might be able to find better in, in insurance. Okay. CLF is just about dead. CLF. Yeah, this was a discretionary call for the service. And um, you can see it gapped higher. It came back in. But it looks okay now that it's pulled back a little bit in here. I wouldn't I wouldn't call it dead, but I think what you're saying is nearing the stop. Yeah. Socks for John. Uh, first of all, this is a three-time leverage thing, so stay away from anything that's leveraged. Um, is that like an inversion, inverted thing or something? I mean, I hear you. It's probably a bow tie. Yeah, it's almost a bow tie. It's pulling back. Unless you're day trading these these stupid things, stay away from them. Avoid them like the plague. Yeah, no problem. I mean, yeah, it happens, <laughs> unfortunately. Uh, LGND, Legend, that's going to be a pharmaceutical company, LGND. Uh, this is one that I do like. I think if we were in better market conditions, and I know I'm talking about some stocks on the Landry list, but I'm not actually taking them personally uh, this time. And I'm also recommending my clients not take them either. But good eye on this. Uh, it, it does look good, especially like the fact that it's kind of faked out in here. Uh, it, if we were in a better market condition conditions, if drugs have it just rolled over, a lot of ifs in that statement, right? I would, I would, probably take this trade but it's like you have to weigh everything okay weigh the good with the bad right and you have to ask yourself could I walk away and be okay and in this case I'd say yeah if you could walk away from this trade and be okay then then leave it but if you feel like oh this is the greatest trade in the world I better take it then take it but in this particular case, it's not really knocking my socks off. I mean, like the little um, the little biotech that was a, a IPO, that was pretty exciting for me. But uh, an established generic drug maker, when drugs are rolling over and the market's kind of questionable, I think I could pass. Okay. KG, why can't I find that one? SID's going to be a gold company. I'm sorry, metals. That's going to be like a Brazil steel company. We talk about this one. Yeah, it's kind of consolidating in here. I think I would leave it alone at this juncture. Maybe if it retraces, even though it's it sort of got choppy in here, but if it retraced or had a big knockout move, it would sort of take on that double top knockout pattern. Usually when a stock goes sideways for this long, I would ride it off and take it off. But the fact that it's going straight up in here, I'll know it when I see it, but I, I don't know, 300% run over a short period of time, I, I, I think I would pass. I think it's too dangerous. I'm just trying to show you, trying to teach what I would see and how it would shake out if it were a little less volatile. It didn't have such an incredible run from lows. looks like it might have gotten a little bit ahead of itself. ETE, Ken says, ETE had pulled back and looks to continue higher. Ken, every time you're in here, I ask you this. There was a famous... Uh, Market guy, I think he has your same your same name. It was controversial too. I wonder if that's you. Is that you? I ask that every time. Uh, ETE is uh, oil and gas, obviously pipelines. Um, it looks like the bottom is in. I, I would prefer if it had bottomed for a lot longer than it did, but it looks okay. Um, but I wouldn't. It looks like it's already triggered in here too. I think it's okay. It's okay. Um, it, it would be triggering. You know, make sure you maybe put it a trigger above today's high. But yeah, you could certainly do worse in the energies. Okay. All right, not me. All right, good. Yeah, because he might have gone to jail. <laughs> I think he might have said that. You always print money trading. You can never lose money. Uh, pause looks good. 
It needs a little bit more pullback, though, because it's had a pretty serious run. So I'd like to see – I'd love to see the mother of all knockout moves of these golds, and then I'm going to be all over them, and silvers, obviously. Art wants to know about NI. Art, you have a – it sounds like a rock star name. That's kind of cool. Um, You want to short it? It looks like it could be in trouble, but it's kind of retraced all the way back to its prior highs. Maybe keep an eye on it as a possible short. I'm not a huge fan of short utilities because they're lower in volatility. Look at the volatility. It's just 20. And as I often say, even in lower volatility stops, stocks, something bad can always happen. So I, I think I'd pass on that one, and it's not currently set up. But I hear you. It looks like it's trying to top out. Free case of beer with every renewal. You got it, Phil. I tell you what, if you pay the shipping, I'll ship you. Of course, I don't know if it's legal, but <laughs> I'll ship you five gallons of my finest homebrew uh, if you renew. <laughs> Rick wants to know about dog. That's going to be one of those uh, inverse stock things. Um, the problem with a short ETF is uh, eventually they all go to zero, okay? So someday I'll open up a hedge fund. I don't know, if anybody know if you can short these? I'm gonna open up a hedge fund. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna, we're gonna short every short ETF and then we're gonna go out and drink beer. That's gonna be fun, okay? And we'll come back in the afternoon and see how much money we made. Um, obviously we're gonna need a little money management in there just in case. But for the most part, all of these short ETFs will go to zero, okay? So unless you're going to day trade them or something, or unless like in 2008 when everything's kind of a rip-roaring downtrend and you're trying to get some exposure to the short side, then by all means. But be careful with these short ETFs. You can short them. Why do they go to zero? Um the reason they go to zero, and I haven't fully wrapped my head around it. Let me see if I could put a little screen up and show you. Is because you're trying to match the short. There's a tracking error, and that tracking error gets exacerbated. I watch how I say that so we can keep it PG-13. And the way it was explained to me once is, and I hope I don't ruin this, but if a market goes down, 10% and then it comes something about when it comes back up begins to rally it has to rally 11.1% so somehow that tracking error and again I get confused it hurts my brain when I begin to think about it but if you look at all those short ETFs they all have an abysmal tracking error because of that and and that's that's one of the problems when you they try to short these things. So longer term, they all go to zero. Okay, here we go. Phil's going to help me out. Phil's always Phil needs. A, Phil's my assistant here. They erode because they are based on the next two futures contracts. As the near one expires, the price moves to zero on the second one. Uh, that's that's true. Yes, that is going to be true for the most part. Um. Yeah, on anything that's futures based, absolutely, because you're going to have a constant decay. Uh, that's going to happen, and especially that's especially true with a lot of these VIX futures, and and that's the world's a complex place. So if you start futzing around with these derivatives, like an inverted triple short whatever ETF, you better know what you're dealing with, and a lot of people get burnt in like these VIX ETF things. Because for that particular reason, Phil, and I'm glad you brought that up because they're based on futures. And I haven't seen it personally because I don't like seeing BC anymore. But I've but I've heard some people who know who are a lot smarter than me when it comes to all these instruments said that people will actually go on CNBC and talk about these things. And they're just absolutely wrong about them. So be careful, even if some kind of if some so-called expert is up there telling you about some of these uh, crazy ETFs. UVXY would be one, right? UVXY. Yeah. 
Yeah, see, this was at 275,000 back in uh, wherever, whenever. I don't even know why these things exist. Can somebody tell me why they even exist? Oh, it was at 128,000, okay? It wasn't actually at 128,000. It's just that they reverse split you to death. So you think, oh, I could buy this because it's a bargain. No, you can't. No, you can't, Danny. <laughs> no, you don't, Danny. <laughs> You better buy more higher and less lower. They exist because HTE stupid people pay too much to hedge overnight. <laughs> stupid people. Oh, okay. You don't want to short them. You buy the adverse. They are paired. Dig dug, etc. Ultra. Take a look at all itself. All's been doing pretty good in here, but uh, like any commodity, it could be a little choppy, and it's kind of beginning to chop around a little bit. For the most part, though, it's kind of working its way higher as of late. Stopped equal hedge fund managers. Stupid. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> He's spelling stupid. S-T-O-O-P-I-E-D. Stupid. <laughs> So you're saying that, that that hedge fund managers go in and buy a bunch of these things and hold them overnight as a hedge. Okay, I got you. TCK for Miss Susan. That's going to be a, a, a metal stock, obviously. Yeah, that looks fantastic. It's got a little a little overhead to deal with. Um, I would be a little concerned about that. And that might stop me from taking the trade. Maybe if it's just a little tiny bit more pullback. For the most part, I really can't pick it apart too much. Uh, I think it might pass, though, based on that overhead. I'd have to study it a little bit further and make a, um, make a decision on here. But try to find something without overhead. If you can't, I think you could do a lot worse than that. So I'm going to give you a maybe on that one. How's that for being decisive? Okay, we talked about Legend. We talked about G Pro. Pause. We got uh, LGCY. We talked about uh, when. Let's talk about when. All right. This is a telecom company. Let's see what's going on. Well, I tried to break out, but came back in. For me to get excited about this one, it would have to break out decisively, and then I would look to play some pullbacks along the way. It has some bad memories, but not too bad. But uh, it would have to. If you're long, stay long by all means. But I, I would look for the next leg on that. By more higher, less lower is how rebalancing works and why they are hard to work in the long run. Can be used if you're right in short term like options. Okay, John, John, good, uh, good answer. Okay, John says buy more higher, less lower is uh, buy more higher, less lower. Uh, regarding how they work is rebalancing. It's hard to work in the long run, but short term. Yeah, I, I could see where short term something like that could work, but. It, it, it could not work enough times to make it not worth your while. All right, we're right at the cusp of the um, the end of the show. Any uh, any last minute uh, requests? Let's see if we can squeeze one or two more in. Yeah, this looks pretty good as a short. Uh, who brought this up, Rick? Yeah, that's a pretty good. It's a little wide and loose longer term, but it does look like pretty good. Uh, it looks okay. Volatility is a little low, but on a short side, eh, I don't worry about it as much. Could have a little bit more volume, but for the most part, I, I think I might have to give you almost a high five on that one because you got a nice thrust lower, a little bit of a pullback in here. I think this one's in trouble. I, I, I can't give you a high five. I'm going to give you a not bad uh, because of the longer term action. I'd like to see just a slight bit bigger thrust lower, but you certainly could do a lot worse than that. All right, uh, as usual, I want to thank everybody for coming. I, I love doing these shows, as you can tell. I have a blast doing them. It's a highlight of my week. I, I get excited when I wake up on Thursdays. I really do. Uh, so thank you guys for showing up. I'm, I'm, I'm humbled that you guys would take time and girls out of your busy schedule to be here. So thanks again for showing up today. Any un unanswered questions, easy for me to say, David, Dave Landry. Dot com. Uh, if you don't have anything, uh, then uh, I guess uh, we'll talk again. Uh, next Thursday, and everyone have a fantastic weekend. Thank you so much. You're welcome, Greg. Greg says, awesome show. Thank you so much. You're welcome, Rick. <laughs>